Welcome to this presentation of MOAD Talks, Luca Chiritza, Art is Storytelling and the Storytelling of Art. Luca Chiritza was born in Milan in 1969 and currently lives in Turin and Milan, where he has taught curatorial studies and museology in the MA program of NAVA, Nuova Accademia di Belle Arti, since 2006. He is the author of Alighiero e Boetti, Mapa, and of many essays on post-minimalist practices and art from the 1990s onward. He is currently working on a retrospective exhibition and accompanying monograph on Massimo Bartolini at Central Pecci in Prato, scheduled for June 2022. Mr. Chiritza has known and been working with Ryan Fridfinson, the subject of his presentation today, since 2008. Luca Chiritza. Good afternoon, everybody. Actually, here arises the first and I hope the last problem of this lecture. This morning in Miami, while I speak, it's late afternoon here in Italy, and uh, who knows when you will watch this video. In any case, I would like to thank uh, deeply Maud uh, in Miami uh, and for uh, this invitation. Uh, to be able again to, to speak and work on uh, one uh, dear artist to me, uh, Ryan Friedfinson. And thanks to Paul Rogers and Ina Carvajal for the assistant, the help, the dialogue uh, during this uh, uh, invitation. Um, so as this title, uh, as the title anticipates, my talk will be focused on the narrative and metalinguistic nature of a good part of the practice of Ryan Friedfinson. Uh, first of all, another disclaimer about the pronunciation of Icelandic names. Uh, and some of you who are familiar with this pronunciation will uh, uh, forgive me for that. Um, but Friedfinson is probably quite okay. So while I use the word metalinguistic, metalinguistics to refer to uh, Ryan Friedfinson's interest in simply referring to and discussing art, its language and its history through his own practice. It is probably necessary to give a short disclaimer of the use I do here of the term storytelling. As you know, and probably experience every day in the last years, this word has gained, or at least I believe uh, in the Western world, a relevant and increasing space in different contexts of our lives from media to politics, from art to sociology, and in our day language or jargon. For example, you have to know that in Italy, we use storytelling in English directly. While storytelling is used here to indicate the narrative potential of a good number of Friedfinson works from the early manifestations to his recent production, I am fully aware of how the word not only became overused and applied on certainly too many aspects and fields of our life, I also know that the term has been marked by a negative connotation, especially for its affabulatory, rhetoric, and even manipulating potential that storytelling has, especially when applied to politics and throughout the use of social media. It will be interesting here to go back to the short and dense essay, The Storyteller, penned by philosopher Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin, 1936, mind the date and discuss the analysis that the philosopher gave there of the figure of the narrator in relation to the decay of oral culture in modern society and discuss it in the context of the politics of those days, the raising of Nazi fascism. That would give us an interesting historical framework of the relation between modernization and oral culture and storytelling. But due to the lack of time, it is, it's here uh, sufficient to say partially, as in my own defense, that my interest in this knot between narration, oral culture, and contemporary art, especially seen in the manifestation that are connotated by a conceptual character, has a long history. I have, in fact, dedicated some texts and essays to this subject in different occasion, and I started in 2005, actually way before social media even existed. Um, 
with a, a text for the Baltic Triennial, a text that then was uh, modified and was republished uh, uh, later in a magazine in 2008, uh, the magazine Uovo, and finally he became a sort of starting point for an exhibition in Melbourne, in the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art uh, in 2011. Uh, these two last texts actually uh, um, add references to Friedrichson. And Storytelling, Nature and Art, an introduction to the world of Friedrichson is a text that I wrote about this artist uh, back in 2012. This is just to frame a little bit the way and the reason why I use a storytelling in relation to uh, Friedrichson and in historical uh, context. Now, uh, speaking about history or art history, uh, before I get into, into the art of my presentation, I need to give a brief art historical premise in order to navigate through my presentation and to appreciate Friedrichson's historical position. A position that I found historically relevant for the new space given by the artist to narrative in the context of post-minimal art in the late 60s and early 70s, 70s and certainly as a forerunner of a rediscovery of narratives within contemporary art, which I believe uh, began around uh, the early 2000s, um, and which is also the uh, subject of this text that I just mentioned. So the context that I want to, to anticipate um, is the one of the banning that modernism operated of all forms of narration. Proclaiming, as you know, the need for an autonomous art, uh, art a whole internal to the logic and characteristic of its linguistic tools, modernism, uh, our, uh, modernism has refused, in fact, all form uh, external to the character of the visual language it adopted. All elements from the real world are therefore excluded, including instances of narration, which was considered like a plebeian, rhetorical and superficial linguistic form a byproduct of kitsch. The American art critic Clement Greenberg, the famous modernist uh, uh, principal theoretician, in 1935, again, one year before uh, the uh, essay that I just mentioned by Benjamin, wrote uh, uh, in a text for a magazine, the Parisian Review, the famous Parisian Review, the peasant is also pleased by the wealth of self-evident meanings which he finds in the picture. He tells a story. As you know, the process of critiquing and superseding Greenbergian uh, theories acted by uh, postmodernist movements like Neodada, Fluxus, and Minimalism became, uh, began slowly but surely to erode the self-sufficiency of modernism structured visual language and to introduce life within the increasingly larger perimeter of the artwork. In this context, we could claim conceptual art as a pivotal in introducing a few timid, at least, and allusive forms of storytelling or narration with which to surpass the pure opticality and silence of modernist ideology. This uh, timid introduction of uh, forms of narration, although very elusive, um, happens through the use of written language and photographic images. Conceptual art initiated a broad use of written language with a variety of goals, as an attempt to dematerialize the art object, as an effort to reach a broader public, and to convey theoretical consideration of the linguistic and epistemological fundamentals of art. Um, as they are of interest to us here, one may mention two more possibilities of the written word by conceptual artists. One uses writing towards a categorization and ordering that is impersonal, archival, and parascientific, often to call into question the criteria by which the word and its phenomena are classified. And we will see how Friedrichson himself adopts this kind of form sometimes. The second uses writing for its ability to name without showing, for its indirectness and imaginative punch, for the way it frees thought beyond the visual limits of the artwork, not to say behind, beyond the limits of the visual realm. And we'll see also some example for the practice of Friedrichson. 
By the way, I think it would not be right to define Fritz Finson as a strictly conceptual artist because there is the range of directions and types of expression explored by his practice is much vaster. On the other side, if his work moves away from the more analytical forms adopted by certain conceptualists, I imagine, for example, art and language and Joseph Kossuth to mention just two, we could see it as belonging to a more lyrical line of conceptual art, a line characterized by a romantic tendency that seeks the potency of imagination, often conveyed by relating to the natural landscape and its phenomena. Uh, in early 2000, and then later in 2007, a German critic, Jörg Geiser, wrote and curated uh, uh, shows um, with labeling under the label of um, um, romantic conceptualism. But actually, Fritz Finson was not included in this uh, text and exhibitions. Finally, and here is a crucial point of my uh, uh, thesis, while conceptual art introduced condensed and elusive forms of storytelling, it is no small merit of Fritz Finson's work to have brought a narrative quality to post-minimalism. Um, in more explicit ways than the most artists of his generation. Moreover, it, uh, if we consider the context of return to interest in, interest in conceptual art from the early 90s, the practice of Friedfinson can be seen as part of a, of a renewed self-reflecting irony regarding the craft of making art and the role of the artist. An element that emerged in those years and at the same time constitutes an important precedent to the more recent attention to storytelling, narrative and oral forms of art that began as I anticipated around early 2000. And uh, expression that also used art history as material and even uh, legend. So if you would be tempting to read the work of Friedrichson, a farmer's son from the Icelandic countryside, as an involuntary yet appropriate answer to the classist assertion of, of Greenberg, this presentation discusses the way in which Friedrichson has used narrative constructs, the language and story of art as founding pillars of his visual language from the early 70s to the present day. To organize my uh, presentation, I will point out a, a double register through which his interest takes shapes generally corresponding to two chronologically distinct phases of his career, phases that I uh, personally imagine and built up, but they are not necessarily uh, um, discussed by the artist. Although the two themes are present in, in his entire over and alternate in his work over decades, we can distinguish a first period running from his artistic beginnings up to the middle of the 70s, and another running from the early 90s to today. In the first phase, the references, references to our narrative dimensions are related to the imaginative possibilities provoked by the use of certain linguistic operations by the artist, and also, very importantly, to Icelandic folk culture. A culture whose uh, rich traditions of sagas, fables, and legends have greatly influenced both Icelandic society and Friedrichson's artistic work. In the second phase, in the second part of my presentation, a, su a substantial group of artworks is constructed around references to and evocations of art history, which Friedrichson sometimes uses as material with a legendary, mythical, and fable character. To use a schematic formula and to go back to the title of this presentation, art as a storytelling and the storytelling of art, history actually. So let's move now to, uh, to giving you some biographic elements that are important to read some of the works uh, I'm going to present to you, some biographical elements uh, of Friedrichson. Um, and then to introduce actually some uh, artworks, some initial artworks where these two dimensions somehow overlap. Um, in the several meetings I had uh, through about a decade 
from about 2008, I guess, to 2018 with the artist. He told me how his education and upbringing from infancy to adolescence played a decisive role in his relationship to the natural landscape of Iceland and his fondness to the twofold theme of storytelling and art history. So some biographical uh, information here. Fritvinsson was a son of a farmer, as we said, living in the countryside, fond of drawing. The family was not opposing. Uh, information of art came especially from pictures and initial phase, uh, initially from pictures in magazine and newspapers, for example, Timin, translated with time, a daily newspaper distributed in the region where he lived, that published reviews of exhibition that were taking place in Ireland, in Iceland. Um, but in the place where he lived, there was only one painting in the home of the vicar. At the age of 10, he uh, finally visited the National Museum of Iceland. And uh, around that time, he had a game changer moment, as he defined. He actually uh, encountered a pamphlet with one image of a composition of Pete Mondrian. Uh, this isolation from direct uh, uh, experience of contemporary, uh, contemporary and modern art was broke by the visit that uh, Friedfinson, when he was uh, 15 years old, had in Reykjavik. Um, actually, when he started to attend the Icelandic College of uh, Arts and Crafts in Reykjavik. Um, his education in, in, the, in the academy was rather traditional with a uh, uh, a teacher that was uh, uh, passionate about Cezanne and uh, was himself a post-impressionist artist. Um, a very important moment is the trip uh, he had in London in 1963 uh, when he visit, visited the Tate Gallery. He learned of the existence of Marcel Duchamp and he, and he saw the, uh, um, the large glass reframed by Richard Hamilton. Back in Reykjavik, uh, Frinson was able to meet Dieter Roth, the German artist. Uh, and another important step, in 19, 1971, he moved uh, to Amsterdam with his wife. Um, and only in Amsterdam, uh, he had the chance to, um, <clears throat> to encounter directly works of some conceptual artists like Robert Berry and Douglas Hubler and Lawrence Wiener, Stanley Brown through the work, the activity of the gallery art and project. Uh, this, in the same years, he discovered the works of land artists like Richard Long and Amish uh, Fulton. And in 1972, I think another very important moment that probably hasn't been discussed very much uh, was when um, Friedfinson uh, um, attended uh, the, the live performance of uh, Bas Janader the Dutch artist uh, in uh, gallery art and project in Amsterdam. Um, a performance titled The Boy Who Fell Over Niagara Falls, where other sat in an armchair reading a true story from the Writer's Digest. Um, later on, Friedfinson invited other to participate in an exhibition in Reykjavik. Uh, and I think this encounter was rather important, although we will see with the dates that some interest in storytelling is already, uh, already started before this uh, encounter. So uh, as these biographic elements would suggest, a connection can be certainly be found between Friedfinson's irregular and episodic artistic education, at least initially, um, based more on reading and word of mouth mouth than the direct experience of art. A relation to how he incorporates art history uh, and its protagonist as almost fair tale material in his work. Uh, living as he did in a social context with a bent for mythological creation. Indeed, we could say that the way in which he treats art as the stuff of legends, storytelling, material and narrative building blocks could have its origin in the fact that in his family circulated books on Icelandic sagas, myths, and legends, which along with novels and poetry have been a, a fundamental influence on his development. 
So to simplify my reading of Friedfinson's work through the lens of storytelling and metalinguistic in his work, I would use a reduced number of examples to illustrate and support my presentation. If some of you visited the exhibition in uh, uh, Miami or somewhere else, maybe would find uh, some more uh, proof of, of that, I hope. So let's move to the first uh, example. The first artwork is Around an Apple from 2004, is a recent work, um, work that is literally built around uh, an apple, as you can see in the image, uh, and uh, is built up as a sort of a visual essay um, with textual and iconographic references to apple found in art history that are presented on the wall, as you can say, as you can see in this uh, detail. Uh, Fried Frinson builds a convergent humorous itinerary leading from the uh, apple of original scene to his own life, when he used to, to attend the painting class uh, taught by Sigurdur Sigurdonson. Here, my first Icelandic uh, problematic pronunciation. Uh, at the Academy in Reykjavik. Uh, and in the short text that is a part um, of the installation, uh, we can uh, understand the story uh, behind the, this work, the episodes that help to build up this, uh, uh, this work. Um, Using an engraving by Durer, uh, then uh, Friedfinson connects the occasional theft of fruit from the uh, composition prepared by the teacher to the theft of the forbidden fruit from the Garden of Eden, as you could see in, uh, in, uh, um, in this image. In both, in both instances, women were the first to be suspected of having committed the original sin driven by an, uh, an appetite for fruit, which we have to consider in Iceland was not easy to come by at that time. We're talking about 1958. So Fritz humorously suggests that a woman once again is accused of having broken the perfect equilibrium that was created by the God, who is also the master, who is also the artist, um, connecting as we saw the biblical episode to uh, his artistic education. Now we move to another work, <clears throat> um, which is actually probably the first work that uh, Friedfinson considered as a uh, part of his uh, actual practice, like a, a, a mature enough to be presented uh, I guess, in uh, exhibitions nowadays. And uh, it's a work from uh, 1964, uh, but it was destroyed and rebuilt in 1992. Uh, the works belongs to uh, the very early age of Friedrichson practice in a moment when, in a period when he was, uh, he, he was back from London to uh, Iceland and when he formed together with other artists, the group Zoom in 1965. The door that you see as part of this work was actually was uh, belonged to an artist who, like Friedfinson, was part of the same group, and he gifted to Friedfinson. Uh, after much thought, Friedfinson decided to forcefully kick the door and then apply the three primary colors on its damaged surface, as you can say, if you could see in the um, in this image and in the latest uh, re remade incarnation of the art piece. By conducting an operation that contains not only a fluxus uh, element of brute force, but also reference to art and its history, the primary colors used by Mondrian, Friedfinson introduces a minimal personal and narrative element in the form of his reference to a fellow artist. We could even read the contrast between the destructive act of breaking the door and the application of an abstract uh, swatch of paint, easily associated with a master of, of uh, uh, abstract art, as a declaration of intent. Now, 
some years have passed from the previous work. We are now in 1971. Uh, there have been years of training, travels, and encounters that culminated to his move to Amsterdam in the same year, 1971. Friedfinson's language moved closer to conceptualism, but still included commentary on the making of art, which he would connect to narrative and autobiographical instance. Drawing a tiger is, as you could see, a diptych of two black and white photographs. The one on the left is the one of the few images that um, depicted Friedfinson occupying his passion, drawing. He's uh, nine years old and he's drawing a tiger while sitting on a bale of hay in the Icelandic countryside. On the right, we see him 19 years later in the same pose but bearded, drawing in a park in Amsterdam. He had recently left France and moved to the Dutch capital to follow his wife's uh, career, but uh, probably also with the ambition of becoming a professional artist. In drawing a tiger, the repeated act of drawing, of making art, seems to confer legitimacy to his artistic activity, becoming an affirmation of his early vocation. On the other hand, the dating of the two pictures, their temporal distance, accords a quality to the act of drawing that we could call foundational, which retrospectively gives new importance, a somewhat mythical dimension to the older photo. We could ask ourselves if this work is constructed not without subtle humorous self gratification to give a sort of myth mythological state to the early act of drawing and as an announcement of self-proclaimed artistic destiny. Now let's finally move to the first area, to the group of works that I indicated in my uh, introduction. As I anticipated, the uh, works of European land artists as Richard Long and Amish Fulton represented together with conceptual art a crucial influence in those years for the artists. Probably under that influence, uh, Friedfinson started to look at his native landscape as a context and a content for his artistic practice. Um, I don't know how many of you is, are familiar with the Icelandic landscape, uh, coming being probably in a context of Miami radically different, but uh, we could certainly say that with the sense of happiness and distance, if not infinity, that it conveys and the importance of sagas and traditional narratives in the culture of this country, narrative that are based, as we said before, on a strong relationship with the magical dimension, the Icelandic landscape became a crucial element of uh, the poetics of the artist. Um, Friedfinson himself declared uh, in an interview uh, that you find in the catalog accompanying uh, the traveling exhibition. When time passed and I found myself becoming an artist, this aspect of the culture almost immediately took a prominent role in my work and remains with me until this day. The intuition uh, I want to underline of Friedfinson was in fact to put in dialogue reference to the Icelandic natural and cultural or even narrative landscape with the most progressive developments in contemporary discourse. Um, I would say, again, think about the um, interest in uh, apotropaic monuments from prehistoric civilization that were explored by artists like Long or in the US by Robert Smithson. Uh, think about the, his interest for the Nazca civil civilization in, in Peru uh, and how uh, Friedfinson somehow intervened in this debate and used uh, Icelandic uh, landscape in this uh, direction. So the first uh, work I want to introduce is Five Gates from 1972 um, that consisted in crafting five large wooden gates, as you probably could see in this picture, positioning them in the middle of a remote landscape in the um, Icelandic uh, uh, landscape by the sea. Um, as the text also explain, texts are often presented in uh, Friedfinson uh, work to explain or contextualize 
what we see through images. Its function, uh, the function of these five gates was uh, of allowing the warm southern wind to pass through, bringing this beneficial element to that strip of land. Although the formal aspect of the work is transmitted by means of documentary for photographic recording, which is a typically conceptual device, another layer of formal presence is given by uh, abandoning the five enigmatic objects in a virtually inhabited place and making them the subject of a story or a legend for the few people who actually had the opportunity to encounter them. Never seen again by the artist after their placement, the doors remained exposed to the natural elements and were almost entirely destroyed by the wind and the sea. You could see still the detail of one of, um, of the gates still intact. The photographic documentation, therefore, the, docu the, the photographic documentation taken at the time of placement and the narrative generated by the work and the only way to know of these presences and together with the word of mouth, a trigger to generate some form of storytelling, if not legend. And this is <clears throat> uh, uh, an attitude that um, Friedfinson will use in other works that we will uh, discuss later. Um, another interesting works of those years is Sacred and Enchanted Places, again from 1972. <clears throat> Whereas Five Gates uses the remoteness of an object in an unusual context as a tool to activate a narrative process, this work is the first time the artist directly samples the legendary narrative material of his homeland. Even more clearly than Five Gates, Friedfinson adopts rigorous and impersonal photographic and textual recordings, which take the form of an anthropological study that is typical of some conceptual art. And you might for sure familiar with uh, the works, uh, the early works of Ed Ruscha and Dan Graham in that sense. Uh, 26 gasoline stations and homes uh, uh, from America. <clears throat> so um, Fred Finson used a kind of same anthropological and taxonomic attitude but applies it to a number of sites in Iceland that were considered by folklore to have supernatural powers. It is important to notice that the story stories reported uh, here in these works, so you could, uh, as you could see, uh, are certainly more extensive than the ones used in the works of similar vein by other conceptual artists. And just to give you a sense of the importance of narrative uh, in uh, Friedfinson's work. Their nature, of course, is also rather different. This text actually came from a clairvoyant lady, as the artist remembers, uh, that map where the Uldu folk, the hidden people, the elves of the Icelandic popular culture lived. So also the matter that was discussed and presented in these works is quite peculiar uh, and unprecedented for those days and for conceptual art. But some other conceptual artists actually uh, are in tune with uh, uh, this uh, research and this specific work of Friedfinson. Uh, other conceptual artists that from the mid 60s used parascientific and seemingly analytical instrument, such as maps, classification, photographs and texts to call into question the divisions and categories into which the world is ordered. Fritz Finson actually took on a subject with an entirely taxonomic approach, as we saw, generating a jump in logic similar to what we see in operations by Robert Berry with the Inner Gas series from 1969, Douglas Huber with the ongoing piece from Variable Pieces from 1970, to 1997, um, and Alighiero Boetti with I Mille Fiumi Più Lunghi del Mondo, which is a book and became later a carpet. Artworks that trying to record almost impossible forms of phenomena uh, or materials. 
So let's move now to another uh, artwork from 1974, uh, which is probably the most known and celebrated work by Friedrichson. A work like uh, some others uh, was an open form and took different incarnations. Now we focus especially on First House from 1974. Um, so the house project started in 1974. Um, and as the artist explained in the text accompanying the work, the idea for First House exactly the first intera interaction, uh, interaction of this project. Oh, let me start again. So this work started in, uh, began in 1974. Um, and uh, as the artist explained in the text accompanying the work, the idea for the first house comes from the book Icelandic Aristocracy written in 1938 um, by Paul Pordarsson or something like that. Um, one of the most important Icelandic novelists of the 20th century. In this book, uh, the nomadic life and the habits of a number of homeless people that the author considered the aristocracy of the islands, the, of the islands are celebrated, considered that Iceland doesn't have a social group, uh, doesn't have um, aristocrats, uh, aristocracy as a social group. Um, one of the story is about, uh, one of the um, short story is about the story of Solon Gudmundsson, an elder, elderly eccentric. Among other activities, Gudmundsson had the idea of building a new house for himself by reversing all its elements, but he was unable to complete the work. Decades later, Friedfinson takes up the idea and realizes the eccentric estate's vision. In a remote, practically inhabited area of Iceland, he builds a small house with wallpaper and curtains on the outside and a door mounted inside out, as we could see in these images, um, you could see the context where the house is placed and then more uh, in detail, also the facade, which is actually the interior of the house with pictures that documenting the building up of the uh, house itself. So what is the sense of Friedfinson's operation and how we could possibly read this strange piece of dwelling? As in some other early works, here storytelling goes hand in hand with a conceptual attitude and possible references to art history, although in a more indirect way. As in the case of other early works, remoteness is a key factor in provoking forms of storytelling. And you could see again the context where the um, house was placed. Almost impossible to visit because of its location, probably easier for excursionists than for the typical art spectators, and subjected to decay by the natural elements, like in Five Gates, the house's existence can be relayed only thanks to photographic material or word of mouth, therefore creating a form of legend. As in other example of conceptual art, the physical or mental distance is what activates new imaginative possibilities. Italian artist Alighiero Boetti used to say, if things are not secret, they get diluted. On the other side, is of a conceptual nature the idea that by turning inside out the house, the entire world becomes the house interior, an inhabitable landscape, one might say. In fact, while Gudmundsson's desire was especially driven by the aesthetic desire to share the beauty of the wallpaper with passersby, Frey Frinson brings the idea to a more abstract and mental level. And you could see the third um, images of the third incarnations, uh, the so-called third house, where 
later on the house was uh, uh, reconstructed only uh, in its structure. But let's stay to the first house. So a mental and, uh, and abstract level that could have some resonance in history or in art history, I believe. Although the artist has never declared this as a references, as a reference, he seemingly reformulates Piero Manzoni's idea behind Socle du Monde from 1961. In this work, the Italian artist, by the way, an, ex an eccentric aristocrat himself, but by blood, further developed the idea of his base magica, magic base, where every object placed on a pedestal becomes, becomes a work of art, as an act of magic, in fact. Given that in Socle du Monde, the caption he prints on the work is written upside down, the pedestal could be perceived as the base of the entire globe. Whereas Manzoni takes Duchamp's idea to the ready-made to an absurd extreme by turning the old world into a work of art, with reference on the world, landscape and nature contained within the walls of the inside out house become our own, our habitat, creating an interesting reversal reversal from art to life in favor of life, which suggests an almost pantheistic openness toward the world. I would actually go further, I would go as further as to suggest that first house can be read as an illusion, allusion to making art and to the artist's identity and role. Could the eccentric aristocrat be an artist in his own right for instance, seems to ask, given his profoundly imaginative ideas and visions, even if they have no practical result? Is art, we might ask, not just an idea that, according to conceptual artists, does not necessarily have to be turned into an object or shape? Does art not consist in the ability to push the boundaries of our imagination into unexplored mental and natural we might say in this case, terrain. You could now see also the latest incarnation of this project, the fourth house that was presented in Munster, Munster Sculpture Project uh, in, uh, a few years ago. So I would like to give you some, quickly some more example uh, of interest, of Friedfinson interest to uh, Icelandic uh, landscape and culture and uh, um, the way works are built up basically on some forms of storytelling. Um, another example is uh, the photographic work to Gustapi, where you could see um, uh, an area that uh, represents one of the most sacred places of the hidden people uh, of Icelandic um, uh, mythology. Uh, the work is accompanied by a long text uh, uh, about a particular story concern, concerning the elves and fairies in Icelandic folk um, that uh, uh, we are not uh, going to read uh, now. Another work, a recent work from 2005 is uh, The Fall, uh, is another work where storytelling and art make, uh, an art making go hand in hand, combining different elements. Um, a text, again, uh, tells the story of a meteorite that fell to Earth in Siberia in 1947, and now an artist uh, witnessed the event and captured the scene right away, making a painting that was reproduced 10 years later on a Soviet postage stamp. Next to, his, uh, to this text, a fragment of the meteorite is on display under glass. The key ingredient here is the connection between a fascinating natural event, which a kind of miraculous apparition, and the Russian artist initiative to immortalize it. Uh, several, several recurrent elements in Friedfinson's work are combined in the fall. The attraction to natural phenomena, which is another crucial interest in his practice, and a taste for storytelling that, turn the, that in turn is linked to art and its history. Now, we uh, mm, uh, uh, witnessed how uh, uh, 
text and words are important for Fritvinson's uh, practice. And uh, actually, um, he used uh, uh, words and text as matter uh, for a few uh, artworks. An early one is uh, called Red Fritvinson's Dream from 1973. Um, and uh, and is, as a later one, which I'll, I'll introduce in a moment, uh, um, is focused on uh, uh, dreams, in fact. Um, this one describes uh, a dream that the artist had about his father, uh, about um, the sudden disappearance and his magical, mysterious apparition. On one end, the frame typewritten text is surely a reference to a specific type of conceptual art. But on the other end, the openly narrative matrix was a novelty for art of the time, just as novel as, as its personal content and its rather mystical tone. Um, in fact, the dream is needless to say yet another matter that is difficult to record, remember and describe like some of conceptual artists were doing with other materials, as we anticipated in, in some works by Robert Berry, Alighiero Boetti, and Douglas Hubler. The second work is <clears throat> entitled from 2002, and is a wall text that reads, Thorsten Surtz dream he was awake, but everyone else was asleep. Then he dream he fell asleep, and everybody else woke up. Now, let's uh, move now to the second area of my uh, presentation of my thesis, uh, which is the storytelling of art and actually of art history. Fred Finson said in, a, in, the, in an interview uh, in the same catalog, I remember around 1989, my work shifted back to stories. While the craft and history of art are, at least partially, materials that Fritzson explored in early work, such as dropping or drawing a tiger, and to a certain extent in First House, in the early 90s, these interests uh, assumes, assumes a more constant presence. This does not seem to be coincidental. Between the mid 70s and the end of the 80s, contemporary art once again traversed, was traversed by neo expressionist and historicist currents that were most often translated into pictorial forms, celebrating the artist as a heroic and Promethean figure, a very different for, uh, from the artistic persona uh, adopted by Friedrichson. Having passed through this phase, not without difficulty, as the same artist as Fritzson himself uh, declared. Um, he gives the impression of wanting to use art and its history as raw material. On the one hand, he looks at the craft of the, art, of the artist, his tools and his rituals with new profound irony and disillusionment. On the one hand, he looks at the craft of the artist, the tools and the rituals with new profound irony and disillusionment, as if in, in, in answer to the decade of excess. On the other, it takes history and its protagonists as subjects of a series of works that contribute to reconstructing, reconstructing a pantheon of ideational references and turn these names and works into matters of legend. To extremely simplified, I could group uh, uh, some of the works that I consider relevant from my thesis from the 90s up to now in two main categories. There are some works where materials and the very labor and techniques of art, the artist's modes of production become subject of the artwork. And others where works and biography of uh, other artists become subject of a tribute or starting point for another artwork. Let's start from probably the, early, the earliest of this, uh, in this new phase 
of the artist from the early 90s and his Atelier Sketch, which is an ongoing work that went on for um, many years. From uh, actually 1990 to 2014, the artist occupied a studio inside an old school in Amsterdam. If his practice does not usually require a production inside the premises of a studio, after a while, Fritfinson realized that even so, a lot of activity was going on there night and day, and especially in, especially in his absence. Spiders were uh, weaving their webs in the corner of the room. Struck by these presences, he collected their webs, framing them under glass if they were ready-made or rather sketches, drawings and artist notes as the title suggests. While the ephemeral beauty of the spider's webs is another sign of the artist's interest in the evanes evanescent material and matter, Atelier sketch can be read, I believe, in different ways. On one side, it is an ironic comment on the artist's status and creativity, on the unproductivity or the uselessness of study for an artist with a typical post-study production mode. While a further reading of the work might derive from the fact that the manual execution of work is often entrusted to others. Here, the production is wrote by creatures that were neither instructed by the artist not pay for the work. Long before Bruce Nauman video installation map in the studio from 2001, and Thomas Saraceno ongoing series of works using spider webs, and probably more in tune with Duchamp's elegy of dust, Fred Finson registered the activity in his studio, a place animated by a present that is not that is known human, as actually happens in the video of Bruce Nauman, but none that but that nonetheless suggests the absence of the artist creator. And in doing so, he crafts an ironic comment on the rights and modes of making art. The installation Fruits of Labor from 2004 might represent a simultaneous continuation of and a counterbalance to the preceding series, where Atelier Sketch celebrates the productivity of unproductivity, the capacity of observation and choice as a creative force, Fruits of Labor places emphasis precisely on the effort needed to patiently execute an elementary job, where work as manual activity is identified with the work of art. Forming something of a, quadri a quadrilogy with the two previous works are the installation titled Suspended from 1991 and Clearing from 2013, which represent further comments on the artist's production modes and the instruments of his craft. At the same time, they might refer to specific mode of expression and perhaps even a specific phase of art that Fritfinson had just witnessed, certainly as an, an interested spectator. These works are made up of a number of wooden sticks, as you could see in the pictures, the sticks that, used to, that are used to steer paint in cans. The sticks are hung on the wall at equal distances to form a kind of environment. The resulting composition might bring to mind action painting or other form of gestural abstraction, which enjoyed, as you know, a comeback in the middle of, uh, in the mid late, late uh, 70s. Seen from this point of view, these works seem to find the humor in the mythological and heroic dimension of gestural abstraction by underlining the prosaic nature of an act that exposes one of the tools used to produce a painting in the sense of an artwork, while literally putting paint on display in the sense of the material. Once again, a work by Fritfrinson seems open to different imaginative possibilities and interpretation. The first of which gives our imagination the capacity to complete the many pictorial works they might have been prepared with those paints and that the spectators does not see. The other is related to his own practice, the proclamation of his radical abstinence from making paintings. 
Now let's discuss the second area of storytelling um, in, uh, in uh, rather recent works of uh, Friedrichson. So indeed, Friedrichson's work is traversed by a pantheon of references that are entirely different from forms of pictorial expressionism and is populated by figures such as Paul Cezanne, Marcel Duchamp, and Pete Mondrian the heroes of his uh, rather late, incomplete, and episodic acquaintance with art history, at least at initial stage. In this group of works that I am introducing now, episodes and artwork from the past are treat, uh, treated as land legends, often overlapping with Fritfinson's own biography and artistic training, which create a linguistic short circuit that oscillates between memory and iron, irony. In this way, first window is not only a photo of a window in the house in which the artist grew up, but it's also a clear reference to the work Fresh Widow, in which Duchamp changes a few letters to transform a French window into wordplay. By going back to see the window many years after his childhood, the artist seems to want to superimpose two temporarily and qualitatively different views by means of an elementary photographic image. The first way of looking at the window as a child is now joined in 1992 by the possibility of seeing it in a perhaps more cultivated, cultivated way through the eyes and example of the French artist. Another example of how art and its story in its history could give new life or interpretation to a banal feature from everyday life, transforming this very object, the window in this case, into a sort of new ready-made. More recently, Fritfinson turns a plastic chamber pot hung high in the exhibition space into a ready-made whose title, Tribute from 2015, makes it another evident homage to Duchamp and its urinal, the famous fountain from 1917, considered the first ready-made. By shifting the work physically and semantically, Fritfinson translates to, to, the, to the letter the intention of the Duchampian revolution, elevating an object that is low in all senses, normally kept underneath the bed, and that is part of artists' daily life nowadays. As in the preceding case, an episode of art history is humanized and acquires a narrative character by bearing a private reference to the life of another artist. And with the last work of this group, um, we see how subjects are represented in the work of artists become the subjects of tributes by Friedrichson. Uh, for example, the mountains depicted in several paintings by Cezanne are portrayed, so to say, by Friedrichson by means of frottage in a literal physical addition to the object of the work by the French master. In the work from Mont Saint Victoire from 1999, Fritfinson responds to the almost sculptural three dimensional character that Cezanne introduced into his painting, and which, as you know, paved the road to the Cubist revolution, with a frottage on paper that appears like a flat relief, as if the rubbing had taken, as I believe, on the surface of the famous mountain itself. Now, to conclude, I would like to mention one uh, uh, work, another quite recent work from 2006, uh, as to kind of conclude uh, my uh, presentation, coming back to the early time of Friedrichson life and artistic education, as to trace a form of circular temporality. So after this portrait of an artist as a, an old man, which was this tribute to Duchamp and to the, the urinal, we come back to the early days of Friedrichson education uh, to art. Um, as Around an Apple, the work where that uh, started this presentation and is only two years earlier, 
uh, and many other artworks, all the prices use references to art history, autobiography and storytelling to the narcissistic dimension of a sort of self-celebration. As the accompanying text penned by the artist explains, we are back in 1958, when the Icelandic publisher Elgafell premiered a series of reproductions of painting by the country's best artist. To advertise the quality of the prints, the company organized a competition and an exhibition with the aim of awarding 10 prizes to the 10 first visitors able to distinguish the reproductions from the originals. And we could see uh, the um, paper uh, that uh, um, tells these uh, stories and this episode. Uh, of the 100 visitors, who took part to this competition, who participated, who went to uh, take part to this competition, only one was able to identify the lot, a young man from Dahlia in West Iceland. As the accounts reported at the time, you could see in this paper, as I, I quote, a student from the Icelandic College of Arts and Craft, the young Ren Fritfrinsson from Beer Midulun, sorry again, received all the prizes, all 10 reproductions. Now these 10 reproductions, as you could see in the last images, unfortunately uh, not uh, perfect images, became the artwork were reused in the artwork I'm discussing now um, and presented in exhibitions. So some early, uh, some uh, 35 years after uh, drawing a tiger with which Fritz Frinsons practically commenced his mature work, the artist revisited another episode from his introduction to art. In this case, he's no longer the emerging artist that he was in 1971, at which point he was already mythologizing his childhood. As a fully fledged recognized professional, a sort of tutelary deity to contemporary, contemporary Icelandic art, Fritfinson again toys with a foundational moment in his career by commenting on the seemingly uh, predestined route that begins in humble provincial origins and arrives at the art world's recognition of his official standing. With the same human sensitivity and jocosity, I believe, that ran through all of his work, all the prices narcissistically restages that personal history and that art history. This new portrait of the artist as a young man seems to advance the, possi the possibility, the hypothesis that those reproductions now adoring the walls of a museum, I don't know if they are in Miami now, not only demonstrated the capability of the artist still in his prime, but also testify now that the reproduction themselves have become a work of art, to his entrance, to the entrance of Fritfinson as, as a mature artist into the restricted Hall of Fame of that is Icelandic art history. And surely, I might hope, and I believe, not only there. Thank you very much for your attention and goodbye. <laughs>